Right, welcome back to your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. This is Business Focus. We're streaming live on Facebook on TV3GH. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. My name is Parkwis Yassari. My guest tonight is Mr. Prince Kofi Amwa Ben. Uh, he's founder of UT Group of Companies. Uh, he was also the chief executive officer of UT Bank. Uh, Mr. Marvin, thank you very much and good to have you on Business Focus. Glad to be here. Um, it almost sounds or seems like yesterday uh, when I put <laughs> up the promo, somebody said, ah, but you, talk, you spoke to him just a couple of days ago. Is this a recorded show? I said, no. The last time we spoke was three years ago yeah, that's before right. I traveled. Right. Uh, so before I bring in Mr. Marvin, let me just give you um, a background to what uh, Moody's has been saying about the uh, latest downgrade and what's informed the downgrade from CAA2, from CAA2 to, um, I think CA1 to CA2. So it says a recent uh, rating downgrade to CAA2 uh, reflects a recent macroeconomic deterioration, uh, further heightening the government's liquidity and debt sustainability difficulties and increasing risk of default. Now, despite Ghana's tightening of monetary policy in response to the global price shock, uh, inflation continues to rise from high levels and the currency exacerbates the government's debt challenges. Combined, a sharp rise in interest rates, high inflation and a rapidly weakening currency exacerbates the government's debt challenges. Now, without external support, the government's policy levers to arrest a worsening macroeconomic backdrop and heavier debt burden are extremely limited. Now, the government's small revenue base, largely and increasingly absorbed by interest payments, further intensifies the policy dilemma between competing objectives, including servicing debt while meeting essential social needs. Now, as a result, a risk of an eventual default has increased. The initiation of the review for downgrade is prompted by the ongoing negotiations between the government of Ghana and the International Monetary Fund over a funding program that may include a condition for debt restructuring. Um, such a restructuring would likely be considered a distressed exchange and thereby a default under the rating agency's definition. You've got to pay attention to that. The review will evaluate the likelihood of a debt restructuring being a prerequisite to secure sufficient and durable financing from official sources to avert a fiscal and balance of payment crisis that is already unfolding. Uh, those were just uh, highlights of Moody's uh, downgrade, which just came uh, a couple of hours ago. But there appears to be some good news. Uh, we're told that six... Uh, banks have joined hands to uh, support the Cocoa City Catered Loan. Six leading banks, including Stanchart, Rubble Bank, ICBC Bank, London, MUFG Bank, they have come together to help us get some $1.1 billion uh, for the Cocoa City Catered Loan. And I'm sure this will bring a bit of reprieve and relief. Uh, to the struggling economy. Uh, let me just bring in uh, Mr. Mwabin. Uh, thank you again for your time and good to have you on Business Focus. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. So what have you been up to? Um, My ever... personal life? Yes, what have you been up to? Not much. Uh, <laughs> you know, I've been going to court. And uh, court is on recess, so I had to celebrate our day and then uh, have some two months off. I will be resuming on... Uh, uh, sometime this month. You've almost gotten uh, used to going to court. Well, it's not a short process, so you better get used to it. I live in the present. I don't live in the past. I don't live in the future. Mm -hmm. So I just um, prepare myself for what is ahead of me. So yeah, I'm pretty much used to going to court. When I put the promo out there, a number of people said, this will be interesting. I can't wait to hear uh, what uh, Mr. Mwabi thinks of the economy. But there was one comment um, that came in and said, uh, What's, what's he coming to say? Is he not in court? <laughs> then I asked, um, does that buy him from speaking about the economy? No, but you just asked me about myself and what I do. So mm. I started by saying that I go to court mm. as one. Mm. Um, I do also, you know, I wrote a book. Yes. And the book is doing very well. Uh, people who read it are fascinated by the story and for the lessons that it gives, especially for the youth. This, this was a prelude to your 70th birthday. Yeah, that's right. And then uh, there's a second book in the orphan, which uh, should be released um, 
maybe November or December or maybe my birthday in February, but the book is ready. And um, this, is, this book is really quite interesting because it tells about this, how to build a successful company. The first book was about how to start in the wilderness and stuff like that. And uh, then I'm, I'm also uh, launching a, a foundation, leadership foundation, which I call PK Mobility Foundation, which is really to harness the uh, potentials of the youth and to give them hope. Because I, I think a lot of people are giving up on the country. And you I think, think there's a sense of hopelessness? Uh, for someone like me who is 70, I'm allowed to say that. But I cannot leave this world thinking that I'm not giving hope to some people and, and, and to the country generally. You know, so we do our bit. We try to get the young ones from the university, tertiary institutions to come and listen to the way to grow businesses, the good habits, the values, and things like that. The interesting thing is, when you've prepared and taken time off and managed to go and deliver to them, you have to provide them with item 13. Otherwise, they're not coming. So I held back a bit and I said, no, I think this is so necessary that I must find ways and means of funding it. That's how come I came with the idea of a foundation. So the foundation probably attracts some sponsors and so on and so forth. And then we use that one to really pull the kids in and then we can impact their lives. Apart from that, um, I play golf uh, and I work out uh, once in a while and uh, I'm good. I'm very good. You've still got hands in a few businesses? Um, not really, not really. Um, actually, businesses that one or two that are in distress and I try to advise them how to get out of it and how to restructure and get out of it. Um, because I have a consultancy that does that. But I'm not really out to grow businesses as if I'm fighting to, to establish or really establish myself. So I'm quite good taking one step at a time and taking it easy. What happened to all the companies, the real estates? You had something going on in Nigeria. They are still there, but uh, what people don't know is that they were weakened after the bank was taken over. That was already a blow to the brand. But then the government took a further step of freezing all the accounts of all the subsidiaries. For whatever reason, I don't know. There's not been any investigation. There's not been any feedback. So they had to re actually restart. But luckily, they are doing well. The properties is there, um, uh, logistics. But I have very little uh, uh, to do with You've them. You've got people who are yeah, managing them. Uh, uh, very, very little to do with them. Not even with the shareholding. I've just left everything to... You've got footprints still in Nigeria? Nigeria is still there, but uh, it was also weakened. So we sold majority shares to a Nigerian. So it's being managed in Nigeria. Um, of course, South Africa, we closed down before we left. And then also we closed our offices in London and uh, Germany long ago. So it's been a downhill and um, it's been quite traumatic, but uh, we weathered it. Do, do, you, okay. do you consider it a monumental failure? Uh, because I know a lot of people like to establish businesses beyond themselves mm -hmm. uh, to meet the next generations mm -hmm. and seeing that you, you build such a strong brand which has almost collapsed in your lifetime. Well, that is what makes me unique. I've seen it virtually all the way to the top and I've seen it fail. So if I say I want to impact people and give them some leadership skills, it's a complete thing. It's not like I've read from a book and I'm telling you what to do. I have experienced it from Cantaman to one room, three people, all the way to most respected CEO, whatever, 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 John Walker and all that. And I've seen it go down. So it's a three, six, complete 360. So when I, I have to give to talk to some people, it's coming from my heart. I'm quite passionate about it. And I want them to avoid the potholes and, 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 the, and the galleys. Mm. Yeah. You must be liquid then, very extremely liquid. I mean, selling all these businesses. No, we, we didn't sell them. They are well, running. You had your, your They didn't have in much Nigeria. value. Okay. They have, didn't have much value. We sold to pay debts, and even the debts are not fully paid. You're not a man of straw, are you? I can't be a man of straw because listen, I'm 70. I have kids that I've educated and things like that, and uh, I'm not saying I live off them, but I I am quite frugal with my life. I have one watch, which is this one. I have one shoe, so I don't need much money. So I don't, I don't have to have a lot of money to, to enjoy life. But you're comfortable. I'm very comfortable, and I've been blessed big time. I'm in great You drive health. a Range Rover. 
Uh, wrong. I don't drive a Range Rover anymore. I drive a Lexus, if that is worse or better. Is that, is that worse or no, better? No, 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 no. It's, it's an upgrade. Mm. And, um, and I live in an apartment and I'm quite, quite comfortable. You sold your mansion for an apartment? I had to sell to reorganize myself, not for me to get broke. You know? So how does the economy meet someone like you? How does it treat people like you? People like you who are quite frugal? Um, I'm not too much worried about people like me. I'm more worried about people who need validation and get so corrupt and do all sort of things that impact the country and the younger generation negatively. When, when you're corrupt, you're killing the future of the country. And I see so much of it around. And so I'm much sure, of corruption? Of course. You can't say people are not corrupt. You, you know somebody today. The man hasn't done anything, he hasn't built any company, he hasn't won any lottery, and he's putting up a hotel, and he's putting up mansions in his hometown. Where's the money coming from? Don't you ask questions? And to validate that, you see that mostly amongst our political elites. Yeah, I mean, really, some, some people, your mates, they go into politics, the next moment, they are millionaires. Isn't that corruption? Isn't that money that they don't deserve that they've taken from the system? And that is how come Ghana is in the state in which it is, which you just gave us a brief about and the downgrade and all. It's because apart from the mismanagement and everything, I think corruption is the biggest uh, headache we have. But it's part of us. You see, nowadays I have stepped back to look at our whole, whole, whole phenomenon of how we always tend to fail. And it's not just Ghana. It's the whole of Africa. And it's not because we don't industrialize. It's not because we don't do this. It's because we are different people and we are bad by nature. I hope it's not too hard for you to take. No, it's not. You know, um, I've, I've sat down to reflect about who we are and how can we always get it wrong. And it's just because we were put in a place where there was too much abundance. And we've lived in this place of much abundance for millions of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. So living in abundance has and actually so shaped us mm. because the environment shapes everyone. Now, when you live in the, where we live with no natural hazards of any sort, if you know what hurricane is doing to people, an earthquake and tornadoes and, and tsunamis, nothing happens in our part of the world. And we have the best of everything. Forget about gold and diamond. We, do, we didn't need them. Food was in abundance and everything. So we created a culture which has become our DNA over such a long time. A culture, for example, that knows no maintenance. It makes sense. If there's plenty, fresh, why would you maintain old one? A culture does, doesn't respect time. Again, your problem is how to spend the day for night to come for you to go to bed. Because all that you need is available around you. You understand what I'm saying? So the problem is we had to create cultures that will waste time instead of trying to save time. We had to create cultures that will waste time. Because if you look around and you see what I'm talking about, our funerals, our adorings, our baby, whatever. Christening. Even sometimes uh, greetings. A total waste of time. We can spend five, ten minutes greeting. You think if there's snow on the ground, you'll be standing there and, and be saying, yeah, how are the goods and the sheep? You know, and then it also created some really bad things that are affecting us in the whole of Africa. Because you were almost self-sufficient. You live in your village with your wife and your kids. At best, your clan and your tribes people. You don't need other people. So naturally, we don't respect other people. You can compare and contrast with a situation where you live in a temperate area. You need someone to supply with woolen clothes, someone to uh, even supply with hay, a carpenter, someone to put a roof on your head, and so on and so So if you, don't, if you don't like them, you respect their being. In our case, you didn't need anybody. So for Africans, when we are stealing, we are not thinking of the effects. But we think, oh, it's for, uh, about me and my family and my tribe, and that's it. And we're not thinking of the wider effect of the nation and beyond. So while you talk about corruption, which of course I agree with you, 
there are wider issues. I mean, the larger issues like uh, the exchange rates, uh, the issues of uh, inflation, which are global. Uh, we had a COVID crisis. We had, uh, we had, we're still seeing the effects of the war in Russia and Ukraine. These are things that the government has alluded to as being part of our problem. It's just a matter of the rate at which it's depreciating. Less than 40 years ago in 1983, the rate of the CD to the dollar was 2.75 old CDs to a dollar. Right. Now, forget about redenomination. That was just the creation that uh, uh, the first government did. So today the rate is what? 10 point something. Yeah, almost 11. So the rate within 40 years has fallen from 2.75 to 100,000 to a dollar. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, what kind of economy is that? Where your currency can fall from 2.7, your currency 2.75 to a US dollar. It's not as if the US dollar is not even falling by itself. Inflation weakens the dollar. But yes, so your currency in relation to US currency falls from 2.75 to 100,000 plus. But we have seen going. other uh, currencies also plummet. We've seen the, uh, the UK pound also perform poorly. By how much? From highest of about 1.5 and it's almost one to one now and they are crying ours is not falling it's tumbling we just go and it's because we don't love ourselves because the kind of corruption and stealing and things that are going on mismanagement that's going on it's really sad how much do you need to lead a decent life you need to be respected in society you need to drive the best cars is that respect that gives you respect i don't respect people by the car they drive. I respect people by the impact they make on society. Really, the people that you see displaying those things, they lack validation. They are not solid in themselves. Because without those things, they are nothing. And where do they get them from? They will do it at any cost because they think by showing off maybe this car or this big house, then you are a big man. But you're a big man because people are broke and they want to pay homage to you and get something out of you. But me and anybody who believes in raising people and caring for people, that's not the kind of people that we need. That's the kind of people that You've talked honest. about the impact of inflation, how it devalues your currency. I mean, um, the purchasing power. It's a global thing now. We've seen... It, most economies across the world, most central banks, try to fight inflation by constantly hiking the, 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 the policy Interest rates. Rate, yeah. Yes. Here, we've seen the central bank do that consistently. A few people have criticized it. You've lived through it. Is that a good approach to fighting inflation? You see, economics is best after the event. In making predictions, anything can actually blown out of uh, the way but what I would say is it's for me you don't have to go the way the textbooks say you want to fight inflation you want to fight uh, depreciation of your currency you buy or you live by your own means right so when I was a kid I was growing up you eat rice Christmas or when my special aunt comes home to visit so my issue is, we know what causes the depletion of the currency. Mm. Excessive demand for foreign money. Now, corruption money, because cities, you need a lot. Corruption money to, they buy dollars and hide in their rooms. And when they have the chance, they take it outside. So it's also serious demand by itself. But let me get back to the main thing. Forget about corruption. You can't afford to import all the rice you are importing to this country. You don't have the money. You don't have to eat rice if you don't have money to buy rice. The oil, the tomatoes, the whatnot that we import in huge quantities are not even imported by Ghanaians. And these things, they must sell in cities and purchase dollars to go and pay those bills. I don't know what's wrong. But if I were in a point to take some decisions, I would say that at least, listen, we are broke. We can't import rice to eat. So if you eat rice, eat local rice. Otherwise, eat plantain, cassava, or something. But that's also going to kill the businesses of party financiers. Key. Now, hold on. If you don't kill that or control that, you are now thinking about re restructuring 
um, government debt, which one is heavier? Well, I'm saying that, listen, eat yam small and eat plantain small and, and let's cut down. And it's not just rice, but let's say rice, right? And think about it. If we take such a policy, the price of local rice probably will shoot up because the people who can't... Demand is going to yeah. go high. Now, the price of other foodstuffs will go up because those who can't afford the high price of, of local rice will now be buying yam and cocoa yam and cassava and the rest, right? Mm. So what happens is to push people into a Greek because that is where you can make the money. And that is what the government is trying to do to put people into a Greek, a Greek processing. And eventually, we can find our people in a Greek and a Greek processing because the returns there is quite... And that's where we have the planting for food and jobs. Okay, you are going to a different area. And I don't know much about it. I don't see much about food and jobs. But people are complaining. The food are in the growing areas, but they are not in the cities or in the urban areas where they have the market because the roads are completely down. Some roads, and I'm sure you see them on social media, it's, it's an eyesore. Roads that were tired when I was a kid, and they were tired by colonial masters. Now that I'm about to die, those roads are unpassable. Not even those roads. Try going Accra to Nsawam, which is the main route from here to Tamale, to Bolga, to wherever, to Ouagadougou, and to Mali. The first 20 kilometers an eyesore. And the sad thing is, our leaders don't have any feeling for it. Because, for example, I know that leadership is by example. If you want people to be, not to be, people to be uh, frugal and to make sacrifices, you lead by making sacrifices. You don't see our leaders do that? When, I'm talking about this road, mm -hmm. and when this road is in this state, what happens, our president wants to sit in a jet and have a shower in the air. At least that's the message that is being propagated around. If it's not true, he has to come and communicate quickly and say, listen, that's not the situation. But they've discounted that. Pardon? They've discounted those rumors. But there are pictures to show. I haven't heard any, any of them discounted it. And they go on that same route with VAs that are bought with our money. That's true. And they just zoom past it. That's And true. those VAs will then be thrown aside because they, 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 they will be depreciated quite early. So we don't see the president setting the, the tone. Leadership best form is by example. I had the experience where the first time we were just about the staff of 12, and one of my staff said I had bought a BMW. I took my time to explain to them why we need a BMW, because we needed to raise money, and you cannot go to people ask for money when your car is in tatters. And they accepted it, and they saw me lead by that. But if the presidency and the leaders are living lavishly, and you want people to actually make sacrifices, it will be difficult. Are you saying that you don't agree when managers of the economy say that we're here, we are where we are today because of the COVID and the Russia and Ukraine crisis? We see, we see the effects, don't we? But the effects are blown uh, uh, out, of proportion. out of proportion because you must do what you can locally. As for a for you can't do much about it. But what are you doing locally to reduce the effect? And we're not doing anything. The government hasn't come out to say that, let's say, we're cutting down on certain uh, expenses and other things because we all have to make sacrifices. But if the debt restructuring and treasury bill is touched... We're going to come back to the debt restructuring because I know you, you have a lot of insight uh, into that. You've worked in the banking uh, industry for some time. But it's obvious that we've borrowed our way into a messy crisis which has completely cut us out of the international capital markets. Did you see this coming? I didn't. I didn't think it would be that irresponsible. But it has caught up with us. And um, we have to support the government for them to bail us out of it. But interestingly enough, any time this bailout issue comes, I think a part of me is weeping. Because, Why? Because, you see, we've gone to the IMF 17, some say 18 times. And for me, it only tells me one thing. We have failed completely with our independence. We have failed? Completely. With our independence? Kwame Nkrumah had a vision, fantastic, the envy of the whole world. When we had independence, Ghana was the most promising colony with very educated people, 
by comparison. Great resources, infrastructure, name it. And Kwame Kuma said, we will manage our own affairs. When you call IMF, you know what it means. It means you've managed and they should come and support you to gain credibility outside. Is that why this government was dragging its yeah, feet? We haven't gone once. Is that why this government was dragging its feet? Because they wanted us to but, manage but, our own affairs. But they did, finally they said they couldn't. So my issue is, the colonizers that we sacked, we've gone to them since independence 17, 18 times. They shouldn't have gone then. Now, the sad thing is, anytime they come, they come and worsen your situation and improve their situation. How? Go back to uh, other, other um, uh, uh, what do you call IMF programs. Diverse teacher, cut down on salaries, cut down or freeze employment. And what do you do? Because they feel under, and they know you're going to mismanage their the monies. Oh, they know? Of course they know. If you come 18 times, don't you believe that? Oh, don't worry, they'll come again. <laughs> you know? But it's serious. It's serious, man. The point is, if you ask me, if we have to go to IMF, and this time that they've come, we should sign a contract with them for them to stay. Because when they go, we'll mismanage again. And then we'll come, we'll go to them, they come back. And this is not free. It's a bank giving you money. We pay for their travel expense, their hotel expense, their everything. We have to pay. It's part of our cost. It's not like Father Christmas. And when they come, especially for Ghana, one thing I'm sure about is because they know the potential of Ghana, the resources and all, IMF will always build Ghana out. I'm saying it. IMF will never say that the situation is that bad and therefore we can't handle it. They will always build it out. Now, what is happening now is, as we call them and they come in, we start negotiations. Moody says, oh, these people, their situation is worse, 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 worse. Somebody who is trying to negotiate, now you are throwing debt at him at the time when he's negotiating. At least you should declare a truce and say, let's keep our uh, grading and let's see what comes out of the negotiation. I tell you, these foreign institutions are in some kind of kaput. And they will never, and I've, I've had it on some social media and some things that go viral. That they want to put us in our place, but we help them to put them in our place. We have to think I'm afraid ourselves. I've got to come in here. Um, we'll take our final break. When we turn, we've got to talk about debt restructuring, how it's going to affect uh, commercial banks. A few things, issues that we, we need to talk about with Mr. Mbarbin. Uh, we'll take a short break. We'll be back shortly. All right, welcome back to Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. My guest is Mr. Prince Kofi Amwabeng, founder of uh, UT Group and former CEO of UT Bank. Uh, so there are talks about a possible restructuring of our debts. Um, some have raised uh, questions about its impact on uh, the domestic banking industry. What do you think? That's a very scary issue. Um, Unfortunately, the government hasn't got it to a point where it can come out with a kind of restructuring of uh, domestic debt. But the longer it stays in the woodworks, the worse it is because people are going to have their speculate. own perceptions and speculate and so on and so forth. Now, banks are in business to safeguard people's monies, um, provide them with liquidity as and when they need it, they can have it, and also give them some return. Now, in any form that that restructuring is going to take, it's going to take away some of these uh, three basic uh, provisions of the court, of, 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 the, the bank. <laughs> of the banks. Now, people are talking about haircut. Haircut is a very dangerous thing. It means, for example, that the government can come out and say that for all his debts, uh, instruments, uh, he'll pay maybe 70% because that's all he can pay. Now, if you, they should do that. There are two classes of uh, people. The banks and uh, pension funds and things are holding government uh, papers, and the individuals are holding government papers. Now, when it comes to the banks, what the, do they do? They pass it on to the depositors or hits them directly. directly. 
if it comes to pensioners, do they pass it on or they reduce the pension allowances of uh, pensioners? Because That's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because some people's pension is not even 100 cities a month. Now, if pensioners' uh, emoluments are reduced, what happens to workers? They should also suffer some, something small because even though, though those who are out are, are being denied. So the effect, you cannot put your finger on it, but it's a scary. The other option the government can take, which is lighter, is to say that I'll restructure the debt. So if it's a 180-day debt... Extend the maturity. Extend, extend maturity. And then the third thing you can do, which is which will be more palatable uh, at least compared to, relative to the rest, is to say that uh, instead of interest rate of 20-something percent, I can only pay maybe 10 percent and bear with us. In any situation, what is going to happen is that it's going to affect the liquidity of the banks. Because in the banks, you have ARC where you plan assets and liabilities, maturities and things like that, so that you stay liquid and you know how much money you can use to lend. So the banks will certainly, at this stage, no bank is going to be lending uh, like normal. Every bank is going to hold back because you don't know what that action is going to be and how it's going to affect your projections in terms of liquidity. And with a bank, as soon as you lose liquidity, you're out. So credit squeeze is automatic. I'm not, don't even talk about the high interest rate. You won't get it. And then the return will certainly suffer because if the government takes 30% off or reduces the interest on the investment, I must also pass it. So we are in that street, but this is a situation where I hope it will be uh, quicker, quick, it will, it will happen speedily and then things will settle. It takes me back to certain times in our lives or the life of Ghana where we've had such rule shocks. You know, in the Rollins era, they seized or they, they just took the 50 city note, which are the highest 50 uh, denomination, they took it out of the system. So if you have 50 cities, it's gone. Then all those who had 50,000 plus in the accounts were supposed to go to vetting committee. It takes me back to those days. And then there was also the situation somewhere uh, where the, uh, of course, the, clo or the closure of banks is another thing that hit the banking sector and so on and so forth. So every so often we have to go through these shocks. And I think it's not good enough for us. The government has said, in fact, the finance minister has said that whatever decision they take, they're going to protect the savings of depositors and make sure that the banking sector doesn't go down the hill that it went uh, some time back. Just in case it fails, would that have defeated the purpose for the banking cleanup? You see, we've gone into this mess partly because of the uh, financial sector cleanup. Why so? Because they use about 25 billion to just pay off deposit the uh, monies which they haven't received. You know? Um, I don't want to talk anything about UT right. because to be like I'm defending myself, right. I'm defending the bank, right. or maybe the court is saying right. whatever. Right. So, we can stay but, but the yeah. point is that it it's, it's you. They always talk about COVID nineteen, Russia, and, Ukraine, uh, Russia, Ukraine, which is funny for me, and then uh, banking sector reforms. These two chunks of money not actually uh, uh, planned from the system, you know. So. You say, I'm going to go back and say, listen, I'm doing a restructuring of the debt, and as it affects the process, I'm going to bail them out. Do we have the money to do that? So I think whatever they do, the, the restructuring will affect the process somehow. Certainly it will affect them with the interest they can get that's in their returns, but depending on the severity of it, it can even affect the... the, 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 the what do you make of calls by some section of the Ghanaian public for your former friend, the finance minister, to take a back seat and resign, even if the president won't sack him. Clearly, the president doesn't have any intentions of sacking him, that he's brought, brought us where we are here we what, are today. What a, what a question. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me, well, why didn't the government decide to bail out UT than uh, rather take it over? But <laughs> to tell someone to resign or not to resign. Do you think he should resign? I see. Do you uh, think he has failed? Of course, if you failed with the money in the finance of the country, then you failed. I mean, UT Bank was taken away from me, and I say, I failed. The back stops with the one who is at the head. 
So that he's failed, yes, he's failed. There are no two ways about it. And, and, and but the president doesn't think so. But the president has failed first. So if you ask me, is the president who has failed, everything starts with the leadership. You appoint everyone. And if you appoint wrong people, they, they, you must be responsible for it. You can delegate authority, but no responsibility. You get what, what I'm saying? What would you have done if you were finance minister running this economy at this time? Uh, you know, there's one UT bank was going down. I stepped down in 2015 as part of the restructuring to say that I've been here for too long. I think I'm not seeing certain things. Let somebody else take over. So I left UT 2015 and it was taken over 2017. So the restructuring didn't work. So to answer your question, I would have left long ago to say that, ah, no, this is not going well and my country is not going the direction that I, I, I wanted it to go. I did it in the company that I formed and I was the founder and I was the CEO, I stepped down. Not the country the sovereign that has country. been entrusted to you by the people. You must be dignified enough to say that, listen, I failed. So that's where we are. The president during the COVID uh, crisis in one of his, you know, um, address the nation said, we know how to bring back an economy. But what we don't know to do is to bring people back to life. You think he can bring this economy back to life? No, no, no. No, 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 not at all. What are you talking, are you that pessimistic? Listen, see, politicians are not the real leaders that we need. But you can get a politician who will surround himself with people who know what they need and knows how to get those people to deliver. I don't see that with this government. Yes, uh, my president, who has people around him, who have all become rich overnight, and he must see. And he does nothing about it. And he stands by them, and he defends them. The only reason why, and I've said it, and I'll say it again, if that is the uh, wife of an armed is an armed robber. So if you stay with people who are corrupt or around you, you must be corrupt because that's why the reason why you I, cannot I, take action against I, them. I, I cannot go what? without asking you about <laughs> this very controversial subject, which has to do with uh, the issue about the uh, data bank and, and its linkage with the finance minister and how uh, they managed to be, you know, part of the you know book runners for all our bond issuances. Uh, personally, I don't read anything about data bank because of me and Ken and the final what happened. But really, at least it's ethically wrong. Certain things you don't do just because there's conflict of interest. You yourself, nobody has to tell you. If it's, as, as it's been reported, that Data Bank and Blackstar or something uh, have brokerage firms that are benefiting, really, if they can sleep in the night, then they, they are tough people. You should judge yourself. You are the judge of yourself. I tell people, if you want to be corrupt, be very careful because you should do things that you can take to bed and sleep with. If you know you can't sleep with it, then you're really cursing yourself. But this is very clear. You can't be sitting on, 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 on the Ghana's purse and any time Ghana raises money by way of borrowing, then you make a cut on the side. But I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that this is happening to us. Because we are not bold enough to say anything. We can't even question it. And this is our country. You know, and so long as people are in positions to benefit, they think it's okay. So long as there are people are benefiting and, and it's, it's on their side, they think it's okay. But it's for all Ghana, all Ghanaians. And you can't allow this thing to happen. People are afraid to talk. They are living in the future. One thing I would say is, I don't live in the past. If you live in the past, you are envious, you are jealous, you have anger in your system, it will kill you. If you live in the future too, fear will kill you. I, I want to live in the present, and I live life as it should be lived. Praise God, Marvin. I thank you for coming. Wow. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you. Nice being with you. Prince Kofi Mwabin is a founder of UT Group and also a former CEO of the defunct UT Bank. He was my guest on Business Focus tonight. Thanks very much for watching. I see lots of your 
uh, messages on Facebook. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I couldn't take them. We've got to wrap up now uh, to make way for News at 7. My name is Park Yasari. We'll see you next week, uh, same time, for another edition of Business Focus. Bye-bye.